Right. Um, our next item is the consideration of report by the superintendent regarding promotion acceleration retention policy K-8. Now, this is the first reading of a possible policy, and I will turn it over to Daryl to explain what we have here. Then, and I, in turn, will turn it over to the chairman of the committee. Mm -hmm. uh, this is our first reading, and the committee has come up with the program you have in front of you. Betty Scheibel chaired this committee, and uh, we had board representation, administrative representatives. You can see the large number of people on that committee. Betty, would you like to uh, address this oh, report? I think the uh, report itself has been reviewed by the committee several times, and this is the last draft that we have sent to you. In addition to that, I've sent you a possibility of looking at a timeline for it to be implemented, and hopefully it would be implemented by next November prior to conference time. Um, this is the time that you really should have it in place because this is the time that parents will be speaking to uh, teachers about the students. For the first year this, this year, for the first time, we have a record of um, retentions and uh, the reasons for the retentions. And they will be put on record for the first time this year. And from here on in, you will be having a record so you will know exactly why children are retained and um, the reasons for it. And Madam yeah. Chairman, we, we can have those uh, prior to the second reading, too, can we not? Yes, the reasons. The I have, huh? I and have the numbers. Them. Yeah, I have them tonight, Good. but uh, right. I can get them to you. I think a workshop for both teachers and uh, parents is very important. And I think the board members should attend these, if at all possible, because I think there's got to be a trend of thinking about retention and acceleration that both parents and teachers in the board are feeling. And included in this was um, a statement about acceleration, accelerating programs for children, and the new special uh, services director would be involved in this too. So he very much would want to be involved in this policy. Any questions? What would this change? Well, why would the, uh, uh, this one say, why would this do uh, special services or uh, uh, director be involved? Okay, because many, many times you have a student coming into school in the area of, um, who needs programming in advanced, uh, advanced classes. For example, you might have a second grade student who is really working at a third or fourth grade level in math. Or you might have a child on the other end who is really working way below level. Now, oftentimes that goes into the pet minutes. But when you, what you need is someone that's co working and coordinating uh, for children who are working at an advanced level. So this is taken care of within this policy. I think I misunderstood or misunderstand why what you just said tells me that the words retention and acceleration are used differently and that when a student needs an accelerated program, a second grader doing work in the third grade so-called level, whatever that's supposed to be, is not moved into third grade, but he's given appropriate work for his level. However, in retention, certainly what I read in this policy means that we don't move anybody upward a grade, but we, in large numbers, move children backward a grade. We don't assume in this policy, we don't assume it now without the policy, and I don't think we assume it then in this policy, that if you are in second grade and there are some parts of your functioning that are perceived to be on a first grade level, again, whatever that's supposed to be, that we then move the student back to first grade so that not only the <coughs> particular area is addressed appropriately, but then the whole student, body, soul, and everything else become supposedly a first grade level. That's a very, I mean, that's one word used in one way and the other word used in a very, very different way. Is that, am I understanding what you said correctly? Well, it, de it depends on, on how you look at it. I think both types of students need to be recognized and their needs need to be recognized. But I, I think that what happens here with, is that there is a number of students that are retained here each year. 
And I think as a board or as, as, as a staff, you need to look at this and see if you're going to have an overall statement that is broad enough to cover retention or that you are going to re really zero in on just specifics. Like if a child is social and emotionally immature, is this enough to retain a child? And that's a good question. And it may be, and it would come out in the minutes uh, of the meeting, of the meeting that you would have. But each child is very much of an individual, and you'll have to look at individual cases. This is why a workshop is very important, because what's coming into me really isn't enough reason at this point to retain a child. Could I request a piece of information to be presented at the workshop where we discuss this? That we have a profile, not names, um, obviously, but a profile of the numbers of students that we have over the past, uh, well, I guess it could only be this year. I was going to say several years would be helpful, but it really could only be this year because those are the only students that you're familiar with. And what the decision has been with the lack of policy that we have heretofore had. And then, according to this assessment, what the decision would then be. Would that be really too much work, or perhaps it would mm. be actually convening a committee I think to discuss it's a, each of these children? No, I think it's. I would like to know what's going to change here. I mean, I certainly think there's uh, plenty of discomfort with what is going on, and I'm not sure reading the policy that much would change because so much of what's in this policy is subjective data. And as I mentioned before, in conjunction with another topic, when you have so many people thinking absolutely along the same lines, that um, data that would be contradictory or data that would be important in other places just is not taken into account. And I think that that is my concern with this policy mm -hmm. and, in fact, this whole topic in this school system that um, certainly in other places uh, where there is some diversity of opinion, where there could be an advocate for the student or for the family who feels that retention, in fact, is known to produce some harmful results for many students for whom, for which it's used. This is a known, well-documented fact, and that uh, that needs to be taken into account. And I think that that part of the information that's available is really and truly not taken into account. It is not given credence here because there are so many people who feel that retention is really basically the first thing you try when there's an indication that there may be one piece or more pieces that look um, askew in a given student at a very, very early age. Uh, when in fact, these known pieces that have show diversity are known to be very, very normal, are expected to occur, and in many places are taken into account when the educational program is planned. I'm not sure what this is going to change. Well, I think one thing, that it will educate the teachers and the parents and the board, because if you read what Lieberman has written, there's a great deal of material there. And then at least everyone will be thinking along the same lines. And then the recommendations would have to be made then. You see, I don't read this the same way. I, I see this as a procedure and a process with a wide variety, a wide variety of individuals who have input in this, including the parent who says no. You know, and by law, that's, that can be it. However, th this appears to me to be a very thorough approach to taking a hard look at a child from numerous points of view, but more importantly, from a host of individuals from the principal to the parent. Now, I don't know if the, all this process was handled before, but it would seem to me that you have to examine here 16 factors into three areas before you can even discuss whether or not it's a good idea. Now, I'm quite certain that that process wasn't here before, but if it was, then we didn't need policy or procedure at it. I think it would make a great deal of difference. And then I only change one thing in the rewrite. Uh, I think the decision of the group would be extremely important if they did their homework. But then, 
you know, or by law, please, the commissioner says, the parent's decision is more important than anything. But I see that in Lieberman. I think Lieberman would not retain a child whose parents didn't want the child retained. Or if the child looked at retention as um, self-defeating. That's all in here as I understand it, Betty. Yes. You see, I think it's a thorough approach to looking, taking a hard look at the child. It isn't the, uh, one of the issues not that, the, that there's retention over the objections of the parent, but the other way around, the parent, that the parents were often, not, maybe I'm wrong, initiate the retention? Well, I'm sure. That does it, happen. That sure. did happen That's this year. That's the opposite. Doesn't yes. It? Yes, that has happened in several cases this year. And perhaps parents have initiated this without having this kind of a workup. Well, you know, I'm just because uh, a child is in a position in the family or a host of things that from a parental point of view, that, uh, you know, a good workup, uh, the group could say, you know, we feel the child should do this and might do very well. I think it's a lot, well, first, we didn't have a procedure that at least we could look at. This is a very excellent beginning. I think this is going to be a tremendous amount of work. Mm, mm, I can see that. But, I, I, uh, think, I think, Fran, I, I'm well aware of your concerns over the year, and I, I think what I like about this a lot is the, the way it makes it much more objective, and there's a lot more information. I know a lot of work went into putting this together, and I... I like all the factors. I like the thoroughness. I like the fact there's a timeline, that it's not something you decide in June. It's something you've been considering, and it's everybody's well informed every step of the way. I like that. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. I absolutely agree. And certainly, the number of factors uh, don't focus in on just a very few um, deficiencies that are tested and noted in our preschool testing. Um, it does seem much more broad-based. One other thing that I would like to comment on, it really, I can't imagine how we will tie it in with a workshop on retention and the, the vast amount of it that we do here, and is it worthwhile, detrimental, beneficial, whatever, is that I think it needs to be said that retention cannot be, or acceleration for that matter, retention and acceleration cannot be considered until there is the absolute supposition that a very high quality and much more importantly appropriate curriculum is offered for five-year-old children in kindergarten, for six-year-old children in first grade, for seven-year-old children in second grade. And if we have gotten so that our first year, first year program, that is to say our first grade, is really much more hospitable for eight-year-olds than seven-year-olds or seven-year-olds and six-year-olds, I think that we can't consider that in isolation, that we have to make a statement about the appropriateness of our first grade for six-year-old children, because after all, that is for whom first grade is intended. And if there seems to be some perception on the parents' part that they defensively have to retain their children, uh, because the possibility of their failure in first grade is so great that they really just don't want to put their children through that possibility, that very real possibility, even though they have the notion that they have a very normal, healthy, intelligent six-year-old child. Uh, I think that that can't be separated from a, this policy. So the curriculum, an appropriate, high-quality, diverse curriculum, and the issue of retention can't be separated. So I hope in the workshop we'll have a chance to tie those two things together. I think uh, this process will force us to focus mm -hmm. yeah. on what you'd be doing to a child, you see. And mm -hmm. then if you analyzed all these 16 factors and the curriculum wasn't there, then, you know, we really had a problem. Mm -hmm. And I think we'd have to face that. As, as soon as a child is referred and the team meets, then your individualization starts. That's when the IEP is developed, and then the child has an individualized plan from there on in, so that the child would, will succeed according to that plan, not according to what the grade level expectations are, perhaps, but the individualized plan for that child. 
because there is an IEP and, and you know, rather than uh, attempt what uh, Fran's asking, because I don't think we can go backwards, perhaps before the next reading, we might go through the process a couple times mm -hmm. and report on the mm -hmm. process mm -hmm. and show you the report, you know, without mm -hmm. the chart, of course. Mm -hmm. And that way, I think we could reinforce, mm -hmm. you know, the kind of workup that comes out of this Lieberman model. And that's probably possible because between mm -hmm. now and the second reading, or a thorough reading of it, we might be able to have a couple, three or four going. Mm -hmm. And we could bring, mm -hmm. rather than go backwards, mm -hmm. we'd show you. I think it would be just as helpful yeah. to do what you suggest. Are there any other questions on the board here? Um, okay, yeah. I've seen a copy of the retention policy, and I have some real concerns about it. I have an October 6th child who's ready for first grade in all ways. Our concern about putting him in isn't that he's not ready for the work. It's that 50% of the children are up to two years older than he is. The other 49% are up to one year older. We've chosen to put him into first grade in a different school situation, where he still will be with older children, but those older children will be second graders, and the expectations will be different. However, if we put him in the Cape, the expectations would be the same with a wide chronological age gap. We were concerned about this two years ago. My husband happened to speak to the chairman of the Education Department at University of New Hampshire. He wrote a letter to us, which I'd like to share with all of you. I have shared this with the school board before. Dear Dr. Z, I looked into the question we discussed about policies for admitting children into the first grade. My colleagues tell me that the practice of screening children and directing many into a readiness program is widespread in New Hampshire. Apparently, the gazelle instruments are used. In short, New Hampshire seems to do about the same as Cape Elizabeth. However, <clears throat> to a person, the three faculty colleagues I spoke with question the wisdom of this practice. First, they tell me the gazelle instruments are 40 plus years old and of questionable applicability today. Second, there is a general concern that while the readiness program emphasis may be justifiable in communities that do not offer a kindergarten program, communities with good kindergarten programs <clears throat> should find that most children are ready for the first grade after completing kindergarten. I read the early childhood report that was done a few years ago here. One kindergarten teacher wanted to hold back 15 children, one seven, and one five. I ask you, if a doctor had a mortality rate of 15 compared to the five, which doctor would you rather go to? Um, third, substantial age disparity among first graders should be reduced as much as possible. An unwise use of screening tests can do precisely the opposite. Fourth, the growing demand for accountability, read that to mean better scores on standard tests, may be prompting school people to find ways to delay entry into regular classrooms in the hope that high-risk students will get an extra year of schooling and subsequently score higher on tests. Our second grade SRA scores have been extremely high only to fall after second grade. By fifth grade, they've fallen quite substantially. My husband was at that school board meeting with Dr. Thurlow, and we expressed our concern about that and thought, hey, this is the reason that this really isn't working. Retention isn't doing what you think it's doing. To summarize, <clears throat> my colleagues believe your concerns are well-founded. There are several reasons to question screening procedures that deny entry into the first grade to large numbers of children who are at the age of typical first graders. Good luck. Sincerely, Roland B. Kimball, Chairman, Department of Education, University of New Hampshire. And he has a um, Doctor of Education from Harvard Graduate School, 1958. <clears throat> now, I'm not asking you to change your policy. If you're comfortable with retention, and I think our rate has been about 25%, if not higher, that's fine. But you've only been telling the parents, teachers, administrators, that retention is good for your child. And I think if you're going to show them that research, and I've done two years of studying it now, you also have to show them the research that says retention may harm your child. I also have another paper here, Developmental Readiness and Placement, Intervention or Avoidance, Relationships Between the Gazelle School Readiness Test and Standardized Achievement and Intelligence measures, measures. That was given at the New England <coughs> Conference on Educational Research in Rockland, Maine, May of 1986. They found that if the gazelle is given before kindergarten, it has very little, little statistical bearing on how well the child does. If it's given after kindergarten, it's more closely equated with a child's IQ. 
So are we, in fact, tracking our children by IQ? Question I'd just like to leave with you. Um, I've seen the retention policy. There are some of the things I disagree with it on um, points to look for. One thing is sex. I don't know how many of you are aware of it, but I think a year ago, 19 boys and one girl were retained in the pre-K program. Um, if you had held back 19 Chinese, I feel I can say that, and one white, I think the Chinese people would be concerned, but yet you felt very comfortable holding back 19 boys and one girl. Statistically, that was really off and it should have raised questions and people should have looked at it. They didn't. Um, I think the policy on retention should be given to every parent. If one in four child is retained, then the parents should be forewarned about this. They should know about it. Um, one other thing on that retention policy, they also had size of a child. My children are all small. My third grader is as big as some kindergartners. Should I have retained him because he's small? It's also putting a bad um, connotation on small. People are the size they are. And I don't think that should be considered when you hold a child back. The other thing was Excuse sex. Excuse me. Uh -huh. Can you just cut it a little short because it is after 10 and we have been here. I will try to cut it short. However, I think the school should realize that the retention costs us 40, 50,000 a year. And it is a big budget issue when you want other things. When you want languages in the school, you'd like the computers in the school, and there are a lot of other things that maybe we could do that might be more profitable. Can I ask you a question on something that mm -hmm. led into your discussion so I can get an understanding of Okay. You talked about uh, your son, and you said that if he went into the first grade in Cape Elizabeth, mm -hmm. that because there's a lot of older kids, a lot of kids that would be at two years older, and in some cases one year older, that a higher achievement level would be expected mm -hmm. of him. Uh, and then you said earlier, though, that there was no problem about his being able to do the work in first grade. So. At, at his level, he wouldn't be doing work a year or two ahead, which brings up another no, excuse, question. No, 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 excuse, excuse me a second. What? So if he can do the first grade, if he can do the work in first grade at Cape mm -hmm. Elizabeth, that's not of any concern. Why is it of a concern that a higher achievement level will be expected? I mean, if he can do it, what's the problem? Isn't because expectations are different for discipline when the children are older, Harold. They ha are required to sit longer. Um, I can tell you, change. I don't want to get into personal anecdotes. Yeah. I'd rather not answer that. No, no, no. But, but okay. You see, what I'm, what, what I'm wrestling with is because if you had said to me, my child cannot do the work in first grade because they've got all these other kids in there and they're all older, so the achievement expectations are higher and therefore we can't do the work in first there grade. There are more children, Harold, there are more children in first grade doing above grade level work and those children go into programs that are geared for children who are doing above grade level work. I would expect my son going in October 6th to do very decent grade level work. And the children who receive the benefits, who qualify for challenge, are the children who do grade benefit level work two years ahead. All right. Now, the, excuse me one second, because that's what I'm getting at, and mm -hmm. you gave me the answer that I was looking for, which is the concern is that if a child goes into a first grade can do the work fine in first grade, getting a good education in first mm -hmm. grade, but there are kids in there who are one and two years older that in the competition between the kids in first grade to get into the challenge program, the younger kid may get left out, whereas if he were in there with kids his own age, he might get into challenge. Yes, but don't use that a reason to cancel challenge, Harold. Uh, I, no, I, I did not. I'm just trying to get the facts out here. Okay. It does. I think it affects my child will not look as good as a child who's 18 months older. So uh, I'm going to put him into a more, more non-competitive setting. Why is it? Now, this, this is something I'm concerned about as a member of the school board is the level of competition between children at the first grade level. You'll have to ask the school that. I'm only a parent who takes part in it. But Harold, I have some more things to say before I get into that, and then you could finish. Well, there's one other study, <clears throat> Mathematic Achievement of Science of um, Chinese, Japanese, and Americans that was published in the American Association um, of Science magazine, just called Science, which is an excellent magazine. It only accepts high-quality research. In that study, 
there was no significant test difference between boys and girls in the early elementary grades. I think that's important because we have a tendency to hold back more boys. And I don't know why. They probably act a little more wild. But their test scores in this very good study were the same. And all I'm asking is, if the school wants to have this policy of retention, which really I'm out of now because my child will not be here next year, um, I think you should share the information, and there's tons of it, with the parent to truly educate him on both sides of the issue. And then let the parent know and make an informed decision, knowing that there's lots of research that thinks retention is a very, very bad idea. Thank you. Thank you, Kay. Is there anyone else who wants to make a comment on this? Just from the committee viewpoint that we had many studies given to us to read, and everything we read, and if they came from all sides, said that all research so far on this issue is flawed, and it didn't matter which way the report read, you had to assume that there was a law of research there. Uh, so you came out of that committee saying to yourself, well, who do I believe, what do I believe, because everything we've been given, whether it says pro-retention or con-retention, it was flawed. So it was a very difficult, and I think, Fran, this is why we came down to, okay, on our local level, we need to tighten up to take a really holistic look at a child not just whether they're young or not, but the whole child and family, the everything that we could take a look at. And that's why we chose the Lieberman model to use. We felt that best suited our needs. And for the first time, I think, I'm not sure it was used this spring or not, Everyone on your retention. Everyone had a copy on it, but it wasn't specifically used. Okay. That from now on, that at least we'll have a better picture of why and the where for is that going into any one child's retention or acceleration. Mm -hmm. Madam Chairman, I just wanted to in uh, indicate that uh, this past, the, these studies that were just presented are not foreign to the administration. We've spent a long year studying these plus numerous others. Probably the best one is the Elliott Pearson study out of Tufts, which is quite current. We are also, at the same time, examining our own curriculum. There isn't too much we can do about the ages of children in various classes today. Uh, we can start with a process that's at the very bottom. There isn't anything we can do about biological circumstances where youngsters are two years older than others in the middle school. And while we have found that the studies intellectually uh, don't match your findings. If you want to play basketball, they do. And we're even concerned about that. And uh, collectively, through the year, we'll take a look at every aspect of the curriculum, and we'll share that with the board in our workshops. And the word we've been using, uh, this has a great deal to do with leveling. And uh, we are working this summer on the middle school ages and we'll be able to give you a full report on that, hopefully, in the fall. So I just want to indicate that we're taking a hard look at the consequences of uh, how youngsters have been placed in the curriculum in the past. The, the difficult thing is when you find or identify areas of the curriculum, uh, where do you change it, how do you change it, and what do you do with the youngsters? if they're shortchanged. And uh, that's a very tough one, and we'll be working on that a long time. Because there are 13 years here where youngsters run through the programs. That's right. I would, I certainly am interested in this last aspect of, of what you talk about. I would hope that you, along with the rest of the administrators, can at least attempt to lessen some of the negative effects of some of the things that we have been doing because I find it really very, very unfortunate that some students, because of something that was done perhaps unwisely so two or three years ago, three or four years ago or whatever, or this very day, uh, will be something with, with which they have to live for their whole time in school, whether they have six years left, eight years left, 
or 12 years left. And I think having had students in another era where quite the opposite was true, there were really very predictable negative results. And I think it's very unfortunate when those become apparent that nothing can be done about the students who are just plain caught in the web of what was not a very wise move in the first place and then the school kind of has to wait for them to get through the machine before really attending to the problem. I'd like to see us address some possibility of helping the students who have really suffered some negative effects, be it via the basketball team or whether it's really inappropriate to ask students 12 years old in the sixth grade to be competing academically, socially, emotionally, in every other way with 13 and 14 year olds in the same classroom. I think there may be some gross unfairness to it and I'd like to see us address that and see if there's a way that we can try to help out those kids who have been caught in this difficult situation. We have addressed that even this year and uh, that'll be all part of our findings. Mm -hmm. and lastly, Madam Chairman, I'd like, I feel very strongly that we could uh, we should uh, publish or educate all of the parents about all of our policies. And uh, rest assured that the administration certainly wants to do that. And uh, we have machinery, all kinds of communication devices to do that. And I think you'll find that uh, we've shared almost all of the board's work in publications at least uh, in the last year and a half. Thank you. I think we're ready to move to the next item. We'll be bringing this up again. Um, any of you who want to talk to us individually are welcome to do so. Let's see, we'll have number nine is the consideration of the superintendent's nomination. Oh, no, request to transfer certain teachers. Right. Madam Chairman, it's my understanding this is for ratification, and we'll be doing this. Uh, perhaps this is the last time, but we'll be doing it again. And there they are in front of you. Uh, those are the transfers to date. And uh, if there are any others, uh, we will bring them to your attention prior to the September. All right. Um, looking for a motion on the transfer. No, I don't know that. Second. The motion and a second. second All in favor? Uh, oh, I think Priscilla or Harold, I don't remember who. who I moved it. All in favor? <laughs> None opposed. Um, item number nine, consideration of superintendent's nomination of teacher candidates and administrative candidates. Right. Now, number one, uh, I'd like to nominate Lucille Emery as librarian at the high school. This is a veteran librarian with more than 20 years of experience. Comes highly recommended brings a very, very strong background in English, has chaired the English committee in her previous school district. Uh, the committee was extremely impressed with this librarian and we're very fortunate to have her. Uh, number two, uh, I'm nominating Kathleen Perez as the reading and writing lab teacher at the high school. As well, an excellent background and strong English background comes highly recommended I might add, board members were on these committees, teachers, administrators, and board members. Uh, and I'm extremely pleased to announce that Wayne Doerr, the Director of Special Education in Augusta, has accepted the position of Director of Special Education in Gifted and Talented here in Cape Elizabeth. He also comes highly recommended with excellent experience considered one of the leading directors of special education in the state by the State Department and his colleagues. Uh, I, I will make a motion to approve uh, uh, Lucille Emery as librarian at the high school and Kathleen Perez as reading and uh, writing lab teacher. And I would make a motion to approve Wayne Doerr as director of special education at Cape Elizabeth as director of special education as his predecessor was. But we had a, uh, we had a long discussion about uh, hiring and creating a director of uh, gifted and talented at uh, two meetings ago. 
I think everybody remembers the discussion we had about it. I, I know that uh, one of the points I made is that uh, you really begin to institutionalize that and create a separate department of gifted and talented uh, when you give somebody that title. But we've moved along nicely without that title all these years. Who suffered because we didn't have somebody with that title? Uh, we had this discussion upstairs, I think it was in March. As uh, far as I'm concerned, based on my uh, years of experience and a variety of activities, uh, once you make somebody uh, the director of, uh, uh, once you create a department head, the department is soon to follow. And uh, we're creating a department head. The, the, the department will not be far behind. Uh, I think the gifted and talent program works very well without a department head. I think it was all right last year, and Donna Morley was just director of special education. I'm surprised by your comments. I remember the budget meeting with the description of the need for more coordination and help with gifted and talented, and I, I don't see where that's going to come from. If not, I, I thought we had agreed at that time that our new director of special education would fill that role. Are you suggesting that this title not be? I think I said that as clear as I could, could. say. That's what I thought, and I'm disagreeing with you as clearly as I can. Well, it won't be the first time. No? Uh, Madam Chairman, uh, first I want to indicate that we've had people who uh, have coordinated the work of the gifted program and, uh, I agree with that. We ought to continue to have people coordinated. Well, the, the problem with that is uh, the people that have been doing it are doing other tasks, and they're unable to do the kind of tasks we feel should be done, and we felt, at least when we came up with this new title, we felt that this person in the central office could do much of the kind of work that has to go to the state, a series of forms, it's a natural position to uh, coordinate much of that work uh, and to allow people like Mary Jo to do what she does best and to allow the teachers who are teaching the youngsters in those programs to uh, stay away from the forums and what have you. Uh, I thought it was clearly stated and agreed upon that this title, and it was mentioned on several occasions, Otherwise, I would not have published it in the newspaper, uh, internally, at a million colleges, and interviewed under that pretense. And it was my clear understanding that the board members who were on the interviewing team were using the same terminology, that we were looking for a director of special ed, gifted and talented. And that's the title that they're using in the 1984 legislation. And we have a mandate to do something about that, and the forms alone are coming in by the dozen. Mr. Superintendent, I may, I may have been in a meeting and may have agreed that, that, that this would be the, uh, the title. I don't recall it right now. Let me just speak to the legislation. The legislation just says you have to have a gifted and talented program. It's one line. That statute is one sentence long. And uh, uh, what, what I fear happening here is we're talking about letting teachers begin to run this program, teach, teaching teachers to deal with gifted children. And, uh, and incidentally, the word gifted, I mean, you know, there is between number 11 and number 12, uh, you have to be pretty smart to discern the distinction in gifts. But in any event, uh, these gifted people, uh, I thought, were going to begin to be integrated into classrooms and that the good teaching staff we have here was going to uh, be trained to deal with these gifted children. Now, if that's the case, if we were moving toward integration and decentralization, uh, this is not an indication of it to me. And that's all. I don't uh, expect to uh, win on this. I think Betty has some. I, I just 
Okay. Would, would like to s say, because of my experience in, in this area, that uh, what Harold is saying is correct in many states. There is a director of pupil personnel, but gifted needs and talented programs need some place to be, and they come under the jurisdiction of the director for pupil personnel. And this is so that if a child is indeed performing at two or three grade levels, that that person is made aware to bring the team together to look at the program. It has nothing to do with pulling the child out of the classroom. It has a great deal to do with looking at how well the child is provided in the classroom. And when you bring parents and a team together to do that, then you have it. But what it is is not necessarily director of pupil personnel and gifted education, but it is director of pupil personnel and gifted and talented comes underneath that jurisdiction. Well, I just want to make it clear that I have no problem with Mr. Doerr. Uh, I do have a problem uh, institutionalizing, uh, uh, institutionalizing this with a department head. And uh, I don't want to belabor the point. I don't think that there is a majority that will join me in uh, asking that uh, it be changed. I assume Mr. Doerr will be approved. He's a very good person. And I assume that the majority would uh, want to give him uh, the title of not only director, uh, well, would be director as well of uh, not only of special education, but of gifted and talented. And uh, this is, uh, you know, a, a special concern of mine, obviously, one that I've raised in the past and will continue to raise uh, in the future. I would hope that we would create symbols that would lead us in the other direction, not symbols that would lead us in the direction that I see this intended to lead us. But I also am smart enough to Ken. Do you have a motion? I have a motion. It has not been seconded. Is there a second to the motion? I, I would like to second the motion, and I'd also like to... That, that's with... That's just director of special education, not gifted and talented. That's correct. Right. Okay. I would just like to comment um, that I find myself in a very much of a dual situation here. Um, if I were sitting in the audience, I would be fighting as hard as I could fight to have somebody give extra special attention to these supposedly gifted and talented students. Because I have seen in my own family that these students get a very different, and I will truly, in all honesty, say a far, far superior education in this school system than do the ordinary average kids in the classroom. That is difficult for people to hear sometimes, uh, but it certainly, in my experience, has been absolutely true. It is a major difference in the quality of education, not only because of the small amount of additional programming that is offered, I think that's the least important reason, but far more importantly because these students have been identified by the school, their parents have been told that they are really extra specially smart, all of their teachers have been told that they're extra specially smart, and lo and behold, they're given extra work, people expect them to perform very, very well, teachers nurture that expectation, parents nurture that expectation, and as if by magic, they do perform a lot better than many of the other students. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy in my view. Truly, there's a very infrequent student who in this school we could label gifted, and I think that there are many people who would say, 5% of this school population is in no way gifted and talented. So to speak directly to whether we're going to call Mr. Doerr the director of special education, period, or the director of special education and gifted and talented, spe special education, it would seem to me, in and of itself, that term includes people who need resources in many directions. and. I think that I would far prefer us to see, to, to have, I would far prefer that our resources be put to making sure that all students, all students have the benefit of 
a group effort in planning to make sure as they move from grade two to grade three that it will be a smooth transition, that their educational program is being advocated for by somebody. And I think there's an awful lot of kids in this school system that get educated really quite by chance. If it works out smoothly, that's very good. And in the cases it doesn't, well, that's, that's kind of the way it is. I think that's wrong. And I think that really um, to have somebody called the director of gifted and talented, the supposition is certainly part of that, that the programming for gifted and talented will be individually um, implemented and certainly grow. It won't diminish that much, we know for sure. It will grow and I think become more separated. I, I really see that as the more logical uh, happening. Certainly we saw it in special education. Let me just add one thing, Fran, to with, with, with my motion. It does not preclude Mr. Doerr from doing the paperwork. I mean, the superintendent that's, can assign him I the mean. job of doing the paperwork. That's what I mean. I think that the supposition is that special education is for students who stand out from the crowd as needing some particular area of expertise expertise or support that is not ordinarily perceived as necessary. And I think the title of Director of Special Education already includes that. The, uh, the difficulty with that is uh, the law mandates a program, and I suspect that the thrust over the next 10 years is going to be to do more for whoever we call, and it will be a state uh, criteria, gifted and talented. That's the, those are their words. But more importantly, I sold this program in the paper and to him and to a committee and interviewed this gentleman that this title was going to be the following and here are your responsibilities. Made it very clear. Special education and you coordinate anything we do with gifted and talented. You see, now, I can only say this, if that isn't the case, I want to be very truthful with that man. Because I was under the impression that this was all agreed in terms of a title. Well, yeah. Mr. Superintendent, I'm clearly under that. This is deja vu for me because we sat upstairs and we had, we had the identical discussion. You, apparently no one remembers having this discussion upstairs. But I think... I, I think we, we had. it seems we had a similar discussion, but I thought we were clear on the outcome that our new special education director would also be the director of gifted and talented, and I think we talked about the thrust of the program of bringing thinking skills into the classroom. That was one of the things we wanted to do for yeah. all the kids and so forth. Absolutely, and, we discussed that. And, uh, I, I am really stunned that, that you two have a problem with this title when we had so thoroughly gone over it, advertised it in the paper, and offered a job. Well, first of all, I, I'm sure you're stunned. Uh, and I can't help that. Secondly, I didn't know, I didn't read the ad. Thirdly, I was not present at the interview, so I don't know what you told me. Uh, you can do all the paperwork you want, and in terms of whether the legislature is going to mandate that we uh, do more, I want to wait for the legislature to do that. In fact, I'd like to make a few statements myself to the legislative committee that considers that. Um, I said this before, and I'll say it again, and in fact, I was supposed to have a conference call with Mr. Sobel, who was the Chancellor of Education in New York today on this very issue, because he's the fellow who said that uh, in Scarsdale, I don't know what you want me to say, he said. Either they're all gifted and talented, or in all of this town, we have three truly gifted people. And that's what it's all about. Do we have a Yasha Heifetz out there? I don't want to argue this whole thing over again, but, but uh, I, it comes as, I, I don't know how stunned you are that I'm concerned about this. I know you're concerned about the, the program. I know you're concerned about that. We're going to have a program. It's, it's mandated by the Carol, legislature, but even, I don't think we have to go overboard here. But even discussing hiring for this job we had in, in our packet, who, who we would be hiring and what the various interviews would be and what their titles were, as I remember it, um, 
It seems to me we've gone over it several times, and you've had opportunities before to object to the title. That's you see, I, I, can't, I can't bring a person in after hiring him for what we said we wanted him and say, you can do the paperwork, but if we have a lousy program out there, you can't touch it. Because you can't even look at it. All you can do is the paperwork. You see, we have a program. Someone's got to coordinate it. And I thought we were even saving money. They're not going to hire a special person. It would be an extra job for a person to coordinate that portion of the program. And evaluate, too. Of course. I mean, I you know, he that's... may feel it's a horrible program. But I can't say you can do the paperwork, but you can't do the rest. I will say that I understood clearly from our discussion that there was a lot of paperwork involved and that we that we, there would be somebody, uh, assumingly the person we would hire to do special education that would also be in charge of getting the forms in from the state since they, certainly with special education, there are voluminous uh, paperwork requirements and so too with gifted and talented and this person would be in charge of it. I agree with Harold that I do not want there to be any tie that adding the words gifted and talented will make any other assumptions that our gifted and talented program, whatever it is supposed to be or whatever in fact it is, must be expanded and uh, made separate from in any way the classroom environment of all of the students. I mean, I think that's the thrust that we sort of clearly indicated and by this title, I really don't want this to say something else by inference. Well, in no way can we increase whatever we're doing presently mm -hmm. for gifted and talented without coming to the board mm -hmm. and saying this is what we want to do. And we've been doing this for a year. And we know there are times when we disagree with something we wanted to do. But this places us in a very embarrassing situation, I might add. If we didn't hear something, or if the superintendent didn't hear something that was being said, it wasn't said clearly enough, or the superintendent had a few biases of his own. I don't know, but the facts are, we hired this person, and we spelled out his duties very clearly in his title. And uh, we... I think we have to vote on your motion in a second. Is there some? Caucus. All right, are we ready to vote right. on the motion? The motion, the motion is to hire all the people and, and without the gifted and talented title. Okay. All in favor? All opposed? And what, did you vote for or are you I abstained? voted, no I did not abstain. Voted I voted for, for the director of special education period. Right. In favor of the motion. All right. So the motion is tied. Fails. Fails. Does not carry. Does not carry. And we can have a new motion. I move that we hire Wayne Doerr as director of special education and gifted in talent. And the other people too. No, he's already. We did this. No, no, they were all in the same motion. I'm sorry. Yeah. It were two. Harold made two motions. He named two people in the second motion. Oh, I thought it was oh. part of the same motion. I'm sorry. Well, make it simple. Uh, but let's just say it was four to nothing on the first two people, all right? It was, wasn't it? On the first two people was been. what I heard. Yes. <laughs> all right, so now my motion was on the title of Wayne Dorr, and that was a two to two vote. So my motion failed. Failed. And now we have Priscilla's motion on Wayne Dorr. Is there a second? I just second that. All in favor? All opposed? The 
the motion carries three to one. Who was opposed? Harold was opposed. Thank you. Thank you. We're ready to move to the next agenda item, and I just want to comment. I was lucky enough to serve on one of these committees, and I was very impressed with the quality of the people who were coming to join us. I think we're fortunate. Mm. Number 10. Number 10 is the consideration of request by the superintendent to have the board approve a plan of correction to address the various deficiencies the state mar fire marshal is citing. And this is the superintendent's recommendation. You will note this is lengthy and really hurts because if you look at this carefully, it's going to cost money. The superintendent is suggesting the following, that we do anything that doesn't cost any money. And then secondly, we do those priorities that should be done after we see the carryover, which would be the second week in July. And thirdly, that once we see the carryovers, we outline a time for the projects, the amount of money we would allocate where we had to do it, and then establish estimates and a time schedule that would go over a year or so. Present it to the board at our earliest convenience and send it to the state fire marshal so we will have complied with uh, these deficiencies. Also, give these deficiencies to the NESDIC school study people to see if they want to incorporate any of those in their study. All right. All right. So that's what I suggest at this point and we would be bringing it back to you, Adam Business Manager, right? Are you prioritizing this as far as what the fire marshal I would just prioritize? Gonna, if I could just address it for one minute. Um, the fire marshal's priorities, as well as I think ours might, should be, are one, the uh, need for the exit windows, or, in the classrooms. Two, uh, the vertical door openings in the various hallways. Um, and then three, the glass issue on the interior of the building, meaning the transoms and uh, or the glass in the uh, classroom doors and so forth. So those are the priorities. As, as he described them to us. Some of this, uh, you know, for instance, like poll stations, um, we could, like, at the end of the school year, when we see what the, where Charlie's budget is, for instance, because this is really Charlie's budget that's going to be impacted, mm -hmm. uh, we might have $700. So we, we should just go ahead and do some of that. But I don't think that we want to do these, these big ones without one coming back to you, because there are issues of whether or not we want to contract it out or we want to ask Charlie's people to do it. But if we do have Charlie's people do it, you would understand the impact would be on his crew, etc. Okay, so I think that what Daryl's saying is until we can see what our carry forward balance is going to be, it's real hard because I mean, we don't have close to enough money to even begin to address, for instance, the windows, the exit windows right now. We don't have that in our budget. So if we could just wait to see what we what we are going to have for carry forward balance, because we must respond to the fire marshal at some point shortly to tell uh, him what we're going to do with regards to each citation and when we're going to do it. That that is required of us. We must do it. So if we establish a plan saying. 1988, we will do such and such. In 1989, right. we will do this other thing. That will satisfy his requirement. This this report, this statement of deficiencies and plan of correction. For instance, it says number one under Palm Cove School: provide manual pull stations for fire alarm system and each required means of egress. We need to type in here when we're going to do that and how we're going to do it. For instance, so we need to go down through each one of these and write in. The, the specifics for each item. And what Daryl is saying is, I don't, we don't think that we can do that until we have uh, a better handle on what we're gonna have for carry forward balance. The fire marshal won't have any problem with that if we write and tell him that. The deputy that was here was very cooperative and, and, and 
he understood that one, we were just about ready to finalize our budget when he was here, and um, mm -hmm. that as a result, we were going to need to have some time to look and see how we were going to incorporate these kind of. One, we didn't even have a handle on the cost at that point. Uh, but Charlie has really get, given this a priority, and we've gone and got the cost so that we could give it to you tonight. Don't we know already that in our new budget that we have, because of receiving that large grant, that we will have $15,000, let's say, uh, because of the matching grant for the handicap granting? Well, I don't know that that's been, that's true, Priscilla, only because it would all depend on how much we did in the school. There's, there's apparently some, uh, the, the total cost to hit, to provide handicap accessibility for Corn Cove and Lunt was 92000 okay? And it hasn't really been decided yet how much we're going to do of all of that. And okay, I, wait, we're okay, going I was that. using the figure of right. 50000 because that's what we that's have. That's right. And, you know, we may end up having some money left there. Therefore, we could, but we don't know right now. We will, though, better know by uh, July or, or the 1st of August, and that is all we're saying is we'll wait till that time to address these mm -hmm. specifically. So, so you need you need our approval to send in the report saying that this is what we're going to do. We'll just send a cover letter in that says until so we have a better handle. I'm sure that will be fine with them. We have a motion. Second. Second. All in favor? Four to nothing. Um, then, Harold. Item 11 is the appointment of a school board member to the Town Comprehensive Planning Commission. This is the result of a letter sent by the Chairman of the Town Council um, explaining that they are establishing a new Comprehensive Planning Commission which will be in business for the next two years and that they need a representative from the school board um, that individual is to remain on the Comprehensive Planning Commission regardless of whether they remain on the school board. And um, I guess we need to vote on that. I am interested in being that representative. I will be going off the school board in December, and I would enjoy having an excuse to keep in touch. Um, I guess we need a motion. I thought this was an appointment, not oh, okay. a, um, a vote. Whatever. I wasn't clear on that. What, you, who, you're my what, who, else, who, who else is interested in this? We've got five members of the school board. Right. I happen not to be interested in this. Who else is interested in it? Francis, are you interested in this? I'm interested in the work of the committee, but I'm not interested in being on the committee. Mm -hmm. Are you interested in this? Yes, I was. <clears throat> And is, is, does Sharon want to resign her post with Governor McKernan to do this? <laughs> they, now I, now I she will, she's still there in Augusta. Oh. I haven't been able to. I have talked with Priscilla. Um, we can handle this any way you want. She felt since I was the chairman, I had the prerogative to appoint myself. Um, I don't know how fair that is. I think the, ch I think the chairman... Uh, uh, I think the chairman uh, can appoint. Uh, the only thing that I would say is that uh, obviously this is an effort to get input into the planning process from uh, all of the boards and commissions that they think they ought to get input in, and that includes the planning board, the zoning board, the school board, the conservation commission, mm -hmm. and the uh, board of historical preservation. So they want input with that. Uh, I, while you don't have to be on the school board to, to do this, I've, I sense that that's one of the intents is to actually have a member of one of these things serving on the Comprehensive Planning Commission because the Comprehensive Planning Commission is going to need input from all of these groups and I don't know whether... I think in speaking with Jane Amaral, the, the intent was to have a member of the commission who was familiar with the needs of the school. 
which I think all of us are well qualified to do. Yeah. Um, I, if you want, we can wait till next month. We have until whenever to do this. There's no rush. All right. Well, I, uh, my my view is that uh, probably they you, you can get on as a private citizen because they're going to get five or six other people on, um, and this seems to me to be a school board thing where they're actually looking for it's a representative by it's ex officio. You're not getting on to the comprehensive planning commission because. Whoever it is that we appoint is not getting on because uh, they're smart or talented or whatever or gifted. Uh, I think we're all uh, gifted. Remember? No, I said there might be a hype that's out there. But anyway, you're, you're getting on because uh, whoever it is gets on because they are to be the school board representative on that group. So that's that's my only feeling. I mean, there are five posts. There are there are five other opportunities to go on in, for a private citizen mm -hmm. who will not be a school board member That's to go on a comprehensive plan. That's Did you have opportunity to talk with uh, Mike McGovern or Jane about the possibilities of serving on as a private citizen, or your being serving as a private citizen? She can't. So she's going to be. She's on the school board for the next two years, so she wouldn't serve as a private citizen. Well, neither so, of them would Eleanor be eligible for that since she's presently on the school board. Is that right? Well, she won't be on the school board. When does this, uh, this goes on for the next two years? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they want the appointment now. That's Well, my feeling is also that we need to talk to Sharon because, I mean, it's very well for us to know that she's mm -hmm. that's it. I've been dying to now, call her. But <laughs> Well, then why don't we I suppose we should wait. If we, if we haven't let's had withdraw input. the item until um, the next mm -hmm. time we meet. Okay. Yeah, rather than find that interesting. True. Fine. Um, the next is setting the date for the next regular meeting. Um, we have been talking all year about the need for workshops during the summer on all these great pressing issues that we've been talking about, like leveling goals, administrators' evaluation, and so forth. Um, one suggestion we've had is that perhaps we schedule two workshops at one regular meeting during the summer, if that's acceptable. See what you think of that suggestion, and then perhaps if we needed a special meeting to hire anybody, we could tack one on to one of the workshops. Okay, the suggestion is a good suggestion as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. So now pick the dates. Uh, the like the Thursday the 25th that we discussed, is a bad date as of today. All right. Wednesday the 24th, which is next week, yes. would be a good workshop date. How is Wednesday the 24th? How is Wednesday the 24th? It's okay for me. No, we have a game with the Cubs that night. <laughs> <laughs> Does that mean you can't do it? I'm yeah, the coach. Who's going to coach? Sorry, Madam Chairman. That's bad. That's, that's right. bad for a member of the board. That's the right. uh, bank coach. Uh, oh. Uh, so we have to go to the next week. All right. Which is? Um, which is? Uh, Why don't we meet on our normal Tuesday in July? In July. We'll call it a workshop or a. Yeah, what's the date of that? That's the um, 7th. Mm -hmm. No. Mm -hmm. oh. What's the 2nd Tuesday? Are you here then? The 14th. The 14th. The 14th yeah. of July. That'd be a great workshop because I'll be getting back on the 13th. <laughs> All right. 14th would be a good way. workshop. Is that all right for you? Mm -hmm. no. I'll take a chance on it. We're going to talk about what to the town. We're going to talk about leveling Level. all those things right. that you I, care I, about, Harold. You wouldn't know. like us doing things when you weren't there. I only get to. I know that. The people in my firm only get a week's vacation. Is uh, that right, Barbara? That's in the middle of it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, 
Oh, okay. okay. All right. All right. Well, what, what can I get? Well, would the seventh be better? Yes. The seventh. The seventh. Tuesday. As a workshop. Are you still here? I As a workshop. Here. Yeah. I leave the morning of the eighth. Eight fine. No, no, no. He no. leaves the morning of the eighth. So it'd be so Tuesday. Tuesday the seventh. Tuesday the seventh. What time's your plane leave in the morning of the eighth? Four thirty. Uh, Okay. So Tuesday, July 7th, but if that's on, the 14th is off. Well, that's a uh, workshop. That will be a workshop and a possible special meeting if you have people you want to hire. And right. We have their titles all lined up. And okay. Have to be all set. Uh, okay. So we can so we'll just set that one okay. for now. For now. Yeah, all right. Hire those gift teachers. That's right. All right. It's quite a few of them. Love Why are you away that week? Michael? No. All right. Oh, Jesus. Oh. So then we say, what about the, the eight? Can we seven? say something? Are you serious? What about the, uh, what about the six? The six? Monday, the six. Monday, the fifth. Is that a holiday? No, what about the Friday holiday? Monday the 6th. Is that all right for everybody? Monday, July 6th. All right, that's fine. All right, the holiday is Friday. And you mean the holiday before this on the court? I guess so. Okay. Leveling. Leveling. Fine. Any special, anything special. Uh, 7.30. 7.30, is that all right? 730. Upstairs. 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 Yes. Yes, away from these lights. Away from the lights. We won't need you. Um, item 13 was, well, was there anything yeah. else under other business, Daryl? Should we have a, do we need item 13 on collective bargaining? Yes. Yes. Our, very, very yes. fast. Yes, definitely. Very fast. Right. Then I need a motion. I move we go into executive session for, I'm going to wait. Uh, collective bargaining. Collective bargaining. Is there a second? Yes. All in favor? Yes. Four to nothing? Can you thank you? Yes. <laughs> That's at 10.50. And we're going upstairs. And we're going upstairs. That's the end of the meeting. What is the bus? No, no. Okay. And you say one door.